Hello friends, welcome to Act Two of Richard the Second, the Second. All the twos. The formal one, I'm calling this. Passed through a sepia filter. Also, the white way round. Someone just pointed out to me um, last week's videos were all mirror image, which I didn't know. I don't know why that's working. What I'm doing, here's the technical thing is, um, I'm now saving these videos in a lower resolution and then feeding them back into iMovie so they don't skip about. The story so far. Edward's seven sons were as seven vials of his sacred blood, or seven fair branches springing from one root. The Duke of Gloucester has been murdered by the order of King Richard. He was murdered by Mowbray. Now, obviously the king is God's anointed. No one can do anything. The king is basically God. But one of the Duke of Gloucester's brothers, John of Gaunt, his son challenges Mowbray to a duel, accusing him of treason, which Mowbray's innocent of since it was done by the orders of the king. Richard has then banished both Bolingbroke and Mowbray, and now he's off to fight wars in Ireland, because I guess that's what English kings do around this time. He comes from a very warlike family. Paying for these wars is a bit difficult, but fortunately for him, he's just learnt that John of Gaunt is now very near death, the father of the banished Bolingbroke. And so he's off to nick all his stuff, basically. John of Gaunt and his brother York are now the only two surviving brothers of the murdered Duke of Gloucester. Explanations and warnings. Well, both really. Uh, when John Gaunt talks about a stubborn jury, he's talking about Israel. There's a lot of uh, crusade think in this play. Oh, and uh, this time round, I'm making York Welsh. Voices. Act two of Richard II, formal run. Ta-da. Act two, scene one. Enter John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, sick, carried in a chair, with the Duke of York, John of Gaunt. Will the king come, that I may breathe my last in wholesome counsel to his unstayed youth, who vex not thyself, nor strive not with your breath, for all in vain comes counsel to his ear. Oh, but they say the tongues of dying men enforce attention, like deep harmony. Where words are scarce, they are seldom spent in vain, for they breathe truth that breathe their words in pain. He that no more must say is listened more than they whom youth and ease have taught to glows. More are men's ends marked than their lives before. The setting sun and music at the close as the last taste of sweets is sweetest last, writ in remembrance more than things long past. Oh, Richard, my life's counsel would not hear. My death's sad tale may yet undeath his ear. No, it is stopped with other flattering sounds, as praises of whose taste the wise are feared. Lascivious meters to whose venom sound the open ear of youth doth always listen, report of fashions in proud Italy whose manners still are tardy, apish nation, limps after in base imitation. Where doth the world thrust forth a vanity so it be new there's no respect how vile that is not quickly buzzed into his ears? Then all too late comes counsel to be heard, where will doth mutiny with wit's regard. Direct not him whose way himself will choose. Tis breath thou lackst, and that breath wilt thou lose. Methinks I am a prophet, new inspired, and thus expiring do foretell of him. His rash, fierce blaze of riot cannot last, for violent fires soon burn out themselves. Small showers last long, but sudden storms are short. He tires betimes at spurs too fast betimes. With eager feeding food doth choke the feeder. Light vanity, insatiate cormorant consuming mean, soon preys upon itself. This royal throne of kings, this sceptred isle, this earth of majesty, this seat of Mars, this other Eden, demi-paradise, this fortress built by nature for herself against infection and the hand of war, this happy breed of men, this little world, this precious stone set in the silver sea which serves it in the office of a wall or as a moat defensive to a house against the envy of less happier lands, this blessed plot, this earth, this realm, this England, this nurse, this teeming womb of royal kings, feared by their breed and famous by their birth, renowned for their deeds as far from home for Christian service, 
and true chivalry as is the sepulchre in stubborn jury of the world's ransom, blessed Mary's son. This land of such dear souls, this dear, dear land, dear for her reputation through the world is now leased out. I die pronouncing it like to a tenement or a pelting farm. England bound in with the triumphant sea whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune is now bound in with shame, with inky Blot and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. Ah, would the scandal vanish with my life? How happy then were my ensuing death. Enter King Richard and the Queen, the Duke of O'Mal, Bushy, Green Baggett, Lord Ross, and Lord Willoughby. The King is come, a deal mightly with his youth, for young hot colds being reigned do rage the more. Queen, how fares our noble uncle Lancaster? King Richard, what comfort, man, how is't with aged gaunt? Ah, oh, how that name befits my composition. Old gaunt indeed, and gaunt in being old. Within me grief hath kept it tedious fast, and who abstains from meat that is not gaunt? For sleeping England long time have I watched, watching breeds leanness. Leanness is all gaunt. The pleasure that some fathers feed upon is my strict fast. I mean my children's looks, and therein fasting hast thou made me gaunt. Gaunt am I for the grave. Gaunt as a grave whose hollow womb inherits naught but bones. Can sick men play so nicely with their names? No. <laughs> Misery makes sport to mock itself, since thou dost seek to kill my name in me. I mock my name, great king, to flatter thee. Should dying men flatter those that live? No, no, no. Men living flatter those that die. Thou now a-dying, sayst thou flatterest me. Oh, no. Thou diest, though I the sicker be. I am in health. I breathe and see thee ill. Now he that made me knows I see thee ill, ill in myself to see, and in thee seeing ill. Thy deathbed is no lesser than thy land, wherein thou liest in reputation sick, and thou, too careless patient as thou art, commits thy anointed body to the cure of those physicians that first wounded thee. A thousand flatterers sit within thy crown, whose compass is no bigger than thy head, and yet, encaged in so small a verge, the waste is no whit lesser than thy land. Oh, had thy grandsire with a prophet's eye seen how his son's son should destroy his sons? From forth thy reach he would have laid thy shame, deposing thee before thou wert possessed, which art possessed now to depose thyself. Why, cousin, wert thou regent of the world? It were a shame to let this land by lease. But for thy world enjoying but this land, is it not more than shame to shame it so? Landlord of England art thou now, not king. Thy state of law is bondslave to the law. And, and thou, a lunatic, lean-witted fool, presuming on an ague's privilege. Darest thou with thy frozen admonition make pale our cheek, chasing the royal blood with fury from his native residence? Now... By my seat's right royal majesty, wert thou not brother to great Edward's son, this tongue that runs so roundly in thy head should run thy head from thy unreverend shoulders. Spare me not, my brother Edward's son, for that I was his father Edward's son. That blood already, like the pelican, hast thou tapped out and drunkenly caroused my brother Gloucester plain well-meaning soul whom fair befall in heaven mongst happy souls may be a president and witness good that thou respects not spilling Edward's blood join with the present sickness that I have and thy unkindness be like crooked age to crop at once a too long withered flower live in thy shame but die not shame with thee. These words hereafter thy tormentors be. To attendants, convey me to my bed, then to my grave. Love they to live that love and honour have. Exit, carried in the chair. And let them die that age and sullen have, for both hast thou, and both become the grave.
York. I do beseech your majesty, impute his words to wayward sickness and age in him. He loves you on my life and holds you dear as Harry, Duke of Hereford. Were he here? Right. You say true. As Hereford's love, so his, as theirs, so mine, and all be as it is. Enter the Earl of Northumberland, my liege. Old Gaunt commends him to your majesty. What says he? Then nothing. All is said. His tongue is now a stringless instrument. Words, life, and all. Old Lancaster hath spent. York. York, the next that must be bankrupt, so, though death be poor, it ends a mortal woe. The ripest fruit falls first, and so doth he. His time is spent, our pilgrimage must be. So much for that. Now, for our Irish wars, we must supplant those rough, rug-headed kerns which live like venom where no venom else but only they have privilege to live. And for these great affairs do ask some charge towards our assistance. We do seize to us the plate coin revenues and movables whereof our Uncle Gaunt did stand possessed. How long shall I stand patient, ah? Huh? How long shall tender duty make me suffer wrong? Not Gloucester's death, nor Hereford's banishment, nor Gaunt's rebuke, nor England's private wrongs, nor the prevention of poor Bolingbroke about his marriage, nor my own disgrace have ever made me sour my patient cheek or bend one wrinkle on my sovereign's face. For I am the last of noble Edward's sons, of whom thy father, Prince of Wales, was first. In war was never lion raged more fierce in peace, was never gentle lamb more mild than was that young and princely gentleman. Now his face thou hast, for even so looked he accomplished with the number of thy hours. But when he frowned, it was against the French, and not against his friends. His noble hand did win what he did spend, and spent not that which his triumphant father's hand had won. His hands were guilty of no kindred blood, but bloody with the enemies of his kin. Richard York is too far gone with grief, or else he never would compare between. Why, uncle, what's the matter? Oh, my lee. Pardon me, if you please. If not, I please not to be pardoned. I'm content with all. Seek you to seize and grip into your hands the royalties and rights of banished Hereford? Is not Gaunt dead, and doth not Hereford live? Was not Gaunt just, and is not Harry true? Did not the one deserve to have an heir? Is not his heir a well-deserving son? We take Hereford's rights away on their own. Take from time his charters and his customary rights. Let not tomorrow then ensue today. Be not thyself, for how art thou a king but by fair sequence and succession? Now, afore God. God forbid I say true. If you do wrongfully seize Hereford's rights, call in the letters patents that he hath by his attorneys general to sue his livery and deny his offered homage. You pluck a thousand dangers on your head. You lose a thousand well-disposed hearts and prick my tender patience to those thoughts which honour and allegiance cannot think. Think what you will. We seize into our hands his plate, his goods, his money, and his lands. Well, I'll not be by the while. My least farewell. What will ensue hereof, as none can tell, but by bad courses may be understood that their events can never fall out good. Exit. Go, Bushy, to the Earl of Wiltshire Strait. Bid him repair to us to Eli House to see this business. Tomorrow next we will for Ireland, and tis time, I trow. And we create, in absence of ourselves. Our uncle York, Lord Governor of England, for he is just and always loved us well. Come on, our Queen, tomorrow must we part. Be merry, for our time of stay is short. Flourish! Exeunt, Bushy at one door, King Richard to the Queen, O'Mel, Green and Bagot at another door. Northumberland, Willoughby and Ross remain. Northumberland, well, lords, the Duke of Lancaster is dead. Ross, and living too, for now his son is Duke 
Willoughby, or barely in title, not in revenues, richly in both if justice had her right. My heart is great, but it must break with silence at be disburdened with a liberal tongue. Nay, speak thy mind, and let him ne'er speak more that speaks thy words again to do thee harm. Pretends that that thou would speak to the Duke of Hereford, if it be so? Out with it boldly, man, quick is mine ear to hear of good towards him. No good at all that I can do for him, unless you... Call it good to pity him, bereft and gelded of his patrimony. Now, for God, tis shame such wrongs are born in him, a royal prince, and many more of noble blood in this declining land. The king is not himself, but basely led by flatterers, and what they will inform, merely in hate against any of us, all that will the king severely prosecute against us, our lives, our children, and our heirs. The commons hath he pilled with grievous taxes, and quite lost their hearts. The nobles hath he fined uh, ancient quarrels, and quite lost their hearts. And daily new exactions are devised, as blanks benevolences, and I wot not what, but what a God's name doth become of this. Well, wars hath not wasted it. For warranty hath not, but basely yielded upon compromise that which his ancestors achieved with blows. More hath he spent in peace than they in wars. The Earl of Wiltshire hath the realm in farm. The king's grown bankrupt like a broken man. Reproach and disillusion hangeth over him. He hath not money for these Irish wars, his burdenous taxations notwithstanding, but by the robbing of the banished duke, his noble kinsman, most degenerate king. But, lords, we hear this fearful tempest sing, yet seek no shelter to avoid the storm. We see the wind sit sore upon our sails, and yet we strike not, but securely perish. Or we see the very wreck that we must suffer, and unavoided is the danger now, for suffering so the causes of our wreck. Not so. Even through the hollow eyes of death, I spy life peering, but I dare not say how near the tidings of our comfort is. <coughs> Nay! Let us share thy thoughts as thou dost ours. Be confident to speak, Northumberland. We three are but thyself, and speaking so, thy words are but as thoughts. Therefore, be bold. Well, then, thus. I have from Paul Leblanc, a bay in Bretagne, received intelligence that Harry, Duke of Hereford, Reynold Lord Cobham, Thomas, son and heir to the Earl of Arundel, that late broke from the Duke of Exeter, his brother, Archbishop late of Canterbury, Sir Thomas Erpingham, Sir Thomas Ramsden, Sir John Norbury, Sir Robert Waterton, and Francis Coit, all these well furnished by the Duke of Bretagne with eight tall ships, three thousand men of war, are making hither with all due expedience and shortly mean to touch our northern shore. Perhaps they hear of this, but that they stay the first departing of the king for Ireland. If then we shall shake off our slavish yoke, imp out our drooping country's broken wing, redeem from broken pawn the blemished crown, wipe off the dust that hides our sceptre's guilt, and make high majesty look like itself. Away with me in post to Ravenspur, but if you faint as fearing to do so, stay and be secret, and myself will go. Ross. To horse! To horse! Edge doubts to them that fear, Willoughby. Will hold out my horse and I will first be there. Excellent. Scene two. Enter the queen, Bushy and Bucket. Bushy. Madam, your majesty is too much sad. You promised when you parted with the king to lay aside life-harming heaviness and entertain a cheerful disposition, queen, to please the king. I did. To please myself, I cannot do it. Yet I know no cause why I should welcome such a guest as grief, save bidding farewell to so sweet a guest as my sweet Richard. Yet again, methinks, some unborn sorrow, ripe in fortune's womb, is coming towards me, and my inward soul at nothing trembles, with something it grieves more than with parting from my lord the king. Each substance of a grief hath twenty shadows, which shows like grief itself, but is not so. For sorrow's eye, glazed with blinding tears, divides one thing entire to many objects, like perspectives which rightly gazed upon show nothing but confusion, I awry, distinguish form, so your sweet majesty, looking awry from your lord's departure, finds shapes of grief more than himself to wail, which looked on as it is, is naught but shadows of what it is not. Then, thrice gracious queen, more than your lord's departure, weep not, more is not seen. Or, if it be, tis with false sorrows I, which for things true weeps things imaginary. It may be so, but yet my inward soul persuades me it is otherwise. 
Howe'er it be, I cannot but be sad. So heavy sad as thought on thinking on no thought, I think, makes me with heavy nothing faint and shrink. Tis nothing but conceit, my gracious lady. Tis nothing less. Conceit is still derived from some forefather grief. Mine is not so, for nothing hath begot my something grief, or something hath the nothing that I grieve. Tis in reversion that I do possess. But what it is that is not yet known what, I cannot name. Tis nameless woe, I wot. Enter Green. God save your majesty, and well met, gentlemen. Um, I hope the king is not yet shipped for Ireland. Why hopes thou so? Tis better hope he is. For his designs crave haste, his haste good hope. Then wherefore dost thou hope he is not shipped? That he, our hope, might have retired his power, and driven into despair an enemy's hope, who strongly hath set footing in this land. The banished Bolingbroke repeals himself, and with uplifted arms is safe arrived at Ravensburg. Now God in heaven forbid... Uh, madam, tis too true, and that is worse. The Lord Northumberland, his son, young Harry Percy, the Lord of Ross, Beaumont, and Willoughby, with all their powerful friends, are fled to him. Why have you not proclaimed Northumberland and all the rest revolted faction traitors? Well, we have, whereupon the Earl of Worcester have broke his staff, resigned his stewardship, and all the household servants fled with him to Bolingbroke. So, Green, thou art the midwife to my woe, and Bolingbroke my sorrow's dismal heir. Now... Hath my soul brought forth her prodigy, and I, a gasping new-delivered mother, have woe to woe, sorrow to sorrow joined, and despair not, madam. Who shall hinder me? I will despair, and be at enmity with cousining hope. He is a flatterer, a, a, a parasite, a keeper back of death, who gently would dissolve the bonds of life, which false hope lingers in extremity. Enter the Duke of York, wearing a gorget. Green, here comes the Duke of York, with signs of war about his aged neck. Full of careful business are his looks. Uncle! For God's sake, speak comfortable words. Oh, should I do so, I should belie my thoughts. More comforts in heaven, and we are on the earth, where nothing lives but crosses, cares, and grief. Your husband, he is gone to save far off while others come to make him lose at home. Here am I left to underprop his land, who weak with age cannot support myself. Now comes the sick hour that his surfeit made. Now shall he try his friends that flattered him. Enter serving man. My lord, your son was gone before I came. Oh, he was. Why, so go all which way it will. The nobles, they are fled. The commons, they are cold, and will I fear revolt on Hereford's side. Sir, I get thee to pleasure to my sister Gloucester. Bid her send me presently a thousand pound. Uh, or, uh, hold, take my ring. Uh, my lord, I had forgot to tell your lordship. Today, as I came by, I called there. And, but I shall grieve you to report the rest. Oh, what is, Dave? An hour before I came, the Duchess died. God, for his mercy. What a tide of woes comes rushing on this woeful land at once. I know not what to do. I would to God, so my untruth had not provoked him to it. The king had cut off my head with my brothers. Why, are there no posts dispatched for Ireland? How shall we do for money for these wars? Come, sister, uh, cousin, I would say, please pardon me. Uh, go, fellow, get thee home. Provide some carts and bring away the armour that is there. Exit serving man. Gentlemen, will you go, master men? If I know how or which way to order these affairs thus disorderly thrust into my hands, never believe me, both... Are my kinsman, Twan is my sovereign, whom both my oath and duty bids defend. But tether again is my kinsman, whom the king hath wronged, whom conscience and my kindred bids to right. I, well, somewhat we must do to the queen. Come, cousin, I'll dispose of you. Gentlemen, go muster up your men, and meet me presently at Barclay Castle. I should to pleasure you too, but time will not permit. All is uneven, and everything is left at six and seven. Exe into the Duke of York and the Queen. Bushy, Baggett, and Green remain. Bushy. The wind sits fair for news to go for Ireland, but none returns. For us to levy power proportional to the enemy is all impossible. Green, besides our nearness to the king in love, is near the hate of those love not the king. Baggett, and that is the wavering commons. For their love lies in their purses, and whoso empties them, 
by so much fills their hearts with deadly hate, wherein the king stands generally condemned. If judgment lie in them, well, then so do we, because we ever have been near the king. Well, I will for refuge straight to Bristol Castle. The Earl of Wiltshire is already there. Well, thither will I with you, for little office will the hateful commoners perform for us, except, well, I curse to tear us all to pieces. Uh, will you go along with us? No, I will to Ireland, to his majesty. Oh, f farewell, if heart's presage be not vain, we three here part that ne'er shall meet again. That's as York thrives to beat back Bolingbroke. As <laughs> poor Duke, the task he undertakes is numbering sands and drinking oceans dry. When one on his side fights, thousands will fly. Well, farewell at once, for once, for all and ever. Well, we may meet again. I fear me never. Excellent Bushy and Green at one door, and back at another door. Scene three. Enter Bolingbroke, Duke of Lancaster and Hereford, and the Earl of Northumberland. Bolingbroke. How far is it, my lord, to Barclay now? Believe me, noble lord, I'm a stranger here in Gloucestershire. These high, wild hills and rough, uneven ways draws out our miles and makes them wearisome. And yet, your fair discourse hath been as sugar, making the hard way sweet and delectable. But I bethink me what a weary way from Ravensburg to Cotswold will be found in Ross and Willoughby, wanting your company, which I protest hath very much beguiled the tediousness and process of my travel. But theirs is sweetened with the hope to have the present benefit which I possess, and hope to joy is little less enjoy than hope enjoy. By this the weary lord shall make their way seem short, as mine hath done, by sight of what I have. Your noble company. Oh, of much less value is my company than your good words. But who comes here? Enter Harry Percy. Oh, it is my son, young Harry Percy, sent from my brother Worcester, whensoever. Harry, how fares your uncle? I thought my lord to have learned this health from you. Why is he not with the queen? No, my good lord. He hath forsook the court, broken his staff of office, and dispersed the household of the king. What was his reason? He was not so resolved when last we spake together. Well, because your lordship was proclaimed traitor. But he, my lord, is gone to Ravensburg to offer service to the Duke of Hertford, and sent me over by Barclay to discover what power the Duke of York had levied there, then with directions to repair to Ravensburg. Oh, have you forgot the Duke of Hertford, boy? Ah, uh, no, my good lord, for that is not forgot which never did remember to my knowledge, and never in my life did look on him. Then learn to know him now. This is the Duke. My gracious lord, I tender you my service, such as it is being tender, raw and young, which elder days shall ripen and confirm to more approve its service and desert. I thank thee, gentle Percy, and be sure I count myself in nothing else so happy as in a soul remembering my good friends. And as my fortune ripens with thy love, it shall be still thy true love's recompense. My heart this covenant makes, my hand thus seals it. He gives Percy his hand. Northumberland, and how far is it to Barclay? And what stir keeps good old York there with his men of war? There stands the castle, by yon tuft of trees, manned with three hundred men, as I have had, and in it are the lords of York, Barclay, and Seymour, none else of name and noble estimate. Enter Lord Ross and Lord Willoughby. Here comes the lords of Ross and Willoughby, bloody with spurring, fiery red with haste. Welcome, my lords, I wot your love pursues, a banished traitor. All my treasury is yet but unfelt thanks, which more enriched shall be your love and labour's recompense. Ross, your presence makes us rich, most noble lord, Willoughby, and far surmounts our labour to attain it. Whatever more thanks the exchequer of the poor, which till my infant fortune comes to years, stands for my bounty. Enter Barclay. But who comes here? It is the lord of Barclay, as I guess. My lord of Hereford, my message is to you. My lord, my answer is to Lancaster. And I am come to seek that name in England, and I must find that title in your tongue before I make reply to aught you say. Mistake me not, my lord, tis not my meaning to raise one title of your honour out. To you, my lord, I come, what lord you will, from the most gracious regent of this land, the Duke of York, to know what pricks you on to take advantage of the absent time and fright our native peace with self-born arms. Enter the Duke of York. Well, I shall not need transport my words by you. Here comes his grace in person. My noble uncle, he kneels. York, show me thy humble heart, and not thy knee, whose duty is deceivable and false. 
My gracious uncle. Tut, tut, grace me no grace, nor uncle me no uncle. I am no traitor's uncle, and that word grace in an ungracious mouth is but profane. Why have these banished and forbidden legs dared once to touch a dust of England's ground? But then more why, why have they dared to march so many miles upon her peaceful bosom, frighting her pale-faced villages with war and ostentation of despised arms? Comes out because the anointed king is hence? Why, foolish boy, the king is left behind, and in my loyal bosom lies his power. Why, but now the lord of such hot youth, as when brave Gaunt, thy father, and myself rescued the black prince, that young Mars of men, from forth the ranks of many thousand French. Oh, then how quickly should this arm of mine, now prisoner to the palsy, chastise thee and minister correction to thy fault? My gracious uncle, let me know my fault, on what condition stands it, and wherein. Even in the condition of the worst degree, in gross rebellion and detested treason. Thou art a banished man, and here art come before the expiration of thy time, in braving arms against thy sovereign. Standing. As I was banished, I was banished Hereford. But as I come, I come for Lancaster. And, noble uncle, I beseech your grace, look on my wrongs with an indifferent eye. You are my father, for me thinks in you I see all gaunt alive. Oh, then... My father, will you permit that I shall stand condemned, a wandering vagabond, my rights in royalties, plucked from my arms perforce and given away to upstart unthrifts? Wherefore was I born? If that my cousin king be king in England, it must be granted I am Duke of Lancaster. You have a son, Omo, my noble kinsman. Had you first died, and he been thus trod down, well, he should have found his uncle gone to father to rouse his wrongs and chase them to the bay. I am tonight to sue my livery here, and yet my letters patents give me leave. My father's goods are all distrained and sold, and these and all are all misemployed. What would you have me do? I am a subject under challenge law. Attorneys are denied me, and therefore, personally, I lay my claim to my inheritance of free descent. The noble duke hath been too much abused. Ross, it stands your grace upon to do him right. Willoughby, base men by his endowments are made great. My lords of England, let me tell you this. I have had feeling of my cousin's wrongs and laboured all I could to do him right. But in this kind to come, in braving arms, be his own carver and cut out his way to find out right with wrong, or it may not be. And you that do abet him in this kind, cherish rebellion and are rebels all. Northumberland, the noble duke hath sworn his coming is but for his own. And for the right of that, we all have strongly sworn to give him aid. And let him never see joy that breaks that oath. Well, well, I see the issue of these arms. I cannot mend it, I must needs confess, because my power is weak and all ill left. But if I could, by him that gave me life, I would attach you all and make you stoop unto the sovereign mercy of the king. But since I cannot, be it known to you, I do remain as neuter. So fare you well. Unless... You please to enter in the castle and there oppose you for this night? Bolingbroke. An offer, uncle, that we will accept, but we must win your grace to go with us to Bristol Castle, which they say is held by Bushy, Baggett, and their complices, the caterpillars of the Commonwealth, which I have sworn to weed and pluck away. Well, I may, maybe I will go with you, but yet I'll pause, for I am loath to break our country's laws. Nor friends nor foes to me welcome you are. Things past redress are now with me past care. Excellent. Scene four. Enter the Earl of Salisbury, who we haven't met before, and a Welsh captain, not York. My Lord of Salisbury, we have stayed ten days and hardly kept our countrymen together, and yet we hear no tidings from the king. Therefore, 
We will disperse ourselves. Farewell. Oh, stay yet another, thou trusty Welshman. The king reposeth all his confidence in thee. Tis thought the king is dead. We will not stay. The bay trees in our country are all withered, and meteors fright the fixed stars of heaven. The pale-faced moon looks bloody on the earth, and lean-looked prophets whisper fearful change. Rich men look sad, and ruffians dance and leap, the one in fear to lose what they enjoy, the other to enjoy by rage and war. These signs forerun the death or fall of kings. So farewell. Our countrymen are gone and fled, as well assured Richard their king is dead. Exit. Ah, oh, Richard! With the eyes of heavy mind I see thy glory like a shooting star fall to the baser from the firmament. Thy sun sets weeping in the lowly west, witnessing storms to come, woe and unrest. Thy friends are fled to wait upon thy foes, and crossly to thy good all fortune goes. Exit. And that is the end of Act 2. Thank you for watching Act 3. When I've finished, we'll go up there. And Act 2 of the previous one, I'm going to stick there. Um, if you want to uh, pay attention to a rattling cup, there's a link to a tip jar in the blurb below. And thank you for your comments. Thank you to everyone who's supported. Like, subscribe. Have fun. Be well. I hope you're doing tremendously. Bye-bye.